I suspect that the, administ that the administration is somewhat surprised by the reaction to the declaration here in Congress and that they probably wish they had drafted the document with a little bit more precision. On their face, the plain meaning of the words in the declaration look to us very much like a commitment for U.S. forces to defend the government of Iraq against foreign and domestic threats in perpetuity. Since the declaration was released, there has been testimony by Secretary Rice and Secretary Gates, an op-ed piece by the two secretaries in the Washington Post, and there has been a classified briefing before the Foreign Affairs Committee, all designed to tell us what the security agreement to be negotiated won't do. It won't mandate that we continue combat missions. It won't set troop levels. It won't commit the United States to join Iraq in a war against another country or provide other such security commitments. And it won't authorize permanent bases. So far, so good. But it isn't entirely clear yet what the proposed security agreement will do. Secretaries Rice and Gates suggested in their Washington Post piece two weeks ago that the agreement will provide appropriate authorities to help the Iraqi government, quote, fight al-Qaeda, develop its security forces, and stem the flow of lethal weapons and training from Iran, unquote. We're also told that we shouldn't worry so much about this agreement because we have these types of agreements with 115 other nations around the world covering everything from authority to fight to delivering the mail. With respect, I think the agreement that both secretaries are describing is likely to be a little more, a little more robust than what would be necessary to ensure that our soldiers get their Christmas greeting cards. And therein lies the problem. Describing the proposed agreement as merely routine is, I believe, disingenuous at best. There is nothing routine about it or the situation in Iraq. And trying to dampen concerns in Congress by suggesting that the declaration doesn't mean everything that it says suggests that the administration either doesn't understand English or has deliberately misled the Iraqis. Neither interpretation is flattering. What exactly did Prime Minister al-Maliki think when he signed a document that provided the United States, quote, security assurances and commitments to the Republic of Iraq to deter foreign aggression against Iraq, unquote. Do you think President Bush was just kidding? Or does he think he and his government actually expect us to help if the neighbors start getting too pushy? And if he does expect help, what does he think that help looks like? Leading Congress to believe one thing and the Iraqis another is a recipe for political disaster at home and a diplomatic catastrophe abroad. The most likely outcome of such irresponsible behavior is the loss of the last remnants of our national reputation. And bearing those political costs in mind, let's go back to one of the things that Secretaries Rice and Gates say the agreement won't do. It won't mandate combat mission. That sounds like good news, but based on their essay, it won't prohibit combat missions either. So the administration clearly expects that the U.S. forces will continue to be engaged in combat in Iraq beyond the expiration of the U.N. mandate later this year, which in turn means the administration will need authority for U.S. forces to fight authority for them to take prisoners, and presumably immunity from Iraqi law for our soldiers. According to a New York Times story from January, and without objection I'll put the story in the record, seeing none, so ordered, the Bush administration has drafted such an agreement. It contains broad authority to conduct military operations, guarantees immunity from Iraqi law for U.S. forces and contractors, and provides the United States with power to detain Iraqi prisoners. If the proposed agreement is as the New York Times describes, that sounds to me much more than a status of forces agreement and anything but 
routine. It sounds more like a commitment for continued open-ended combat, and I think it would constitute precisely the type of long-term commitment that should not be entered into during the current administration without the express approval of Congress. As a matter of constitutional principle, and as a matter of sound foreign policy, and as a matter of plain old common sense, it seems to me that U.S. security commitments, and especially solemn promises to defend another nation, should come in the form of a treaty. Even in instances where we have reserved for ourselves the right to intervene to defend another nation, we have done repeatedly, as we have done repeatedly in Latin America, those interventions were based on a treaty ratified by the Senate, whatever one might think about the treaties themselves. While some have pointed out to our current operations in Afghanistan as a, pre as a precedent, the underlying legal authority for our presence there comes from the Congress and from the international community in the form of United Nations mandates, not from a bilateral agreement with the administration of, of Afghanistan. So far, what I know about the administration's intentions leads me to the inexorable conclusion that there is quite a lot of us, a lot for us to be concerned about, that Congress does need to be intensely involved in this process, and that this afternoon's hearing, as I noted, is only the beginning of our discussions and not the end. The State Department's own rules require it to always ensure, quote, that the utmost care is exercised to avoid any invasion or compromise of the constitutional powers of the President, the Senate, and the Congress as a whole, unquote. My thoughts exactly.